In this video, we're going to talk about the biosynthesis of DNA viruses. And biosynthesis includes the steps of genome replication, transcription of viral messenger RNAs, and the translation of those mRNAs into proteins. Now, several videos ago, I brought up the Baltimore system of viral classification. And if you recall, this system of classification is based around how a virus makes its messenger RNAs. Here in the very center of our table is a messenger RNA, and the way this diagram is set up, each genome type points directly toward that messenger RNA. So for today's video, we're going to be focusing more on our class 1 and class 2 viruses. Those class 1 viruses have a double-stranded DNA genome. It does not matter if it's linear or circle, just a double-stranded DNA genome. And the class 2 viruses have a single-stranded DNA genome. Now both of these types of viruses, class 1 and class 2, are all going to follow the central dogma of molecular biology. That is, they're going to use their DNA as a template to make messenger RNAs, and those RNAs are used as a template to make proteins. Once the viral genome has been deposited into the cell, there are really three main stages of biosynthesis. The first is that our viral genome is going to be used for the production of messenger RNAs, which then give rise to our first set of proteins. Now we call these proteins the immediate early proteins because they're the very first set of proteins that are made during viral replication. And these proteins actually stimulate the transcription of more messenger RNAs from our viral genome to give rise to our second set of proteins. This second set of proteins are called the early proteins. Like with our immediate early proteins, these early proteins will have a job to do, and that job generally involves switching biosynthesis from mRNA production to genome replication, along with stimulating transcription of messenger RNAs that will give rise to what we call the late proteins. These late proteins are actually our capsid proteins and our envelope proteins, and they will combine with newly replicated viral genomes to make our virions. So these immediate early proteins tend to be transcription factors that stimulate the production of our early genes. These early proteins signal the shift to DNA replication and to synthesis of those late proteins. Many of these early proteins tend to be enzymes, and they can be involved in the processes of DNA replication, or they can be enzymes that modify the host cell to make it a more favorable environment for viral replication. And again, our late proteins are what we call the structural proteins, and they make up the capsid and any envelope proteins that an enveloped virus may have. Recall that viruses are very, very simple organisms, and they cannot live outside of a host cell. So in order to replicate their viral genome, they need certain things from the cell. They have to scavenge them from the cell. One of the main things that all viruses are going to need are DNTPs, or the deoxynucleotide triphosphates. So those A's, T's, C's, and G's for DNA replication. And for RNA synthesis, for transcription, they need those A, U's, C's, and G's. Additionally, most DNA viruses need some host proteins. This virus right here is one of our parvoviruses. They are very, very small. And those viruses that have smaller genomes use more host proteins to carry out their DNA replication because they have less space within their genome to encode large proteins like DNA polymerases. Viruses with larger and more complex DNA genomes may encode many, but not all, of the proteins required for DNA replication. A great example of a virus that encodes many of its own proteins for DNA replication is smallpox. Smallpox has, in viral terms, a huge genome, and it actually replicates in the cytoplasm of cells, so it encodes its own DNA polymerase and most of the machinery needed for DNA replication. Where then do these DNA viruses get their polymerases? Where do those polymerases come from? Well, our very small DNA viruses, like parvovirus, 
like polyomaviruses, do not encode their own polymerases. Again, their genome size is too small to dedicate space to large proteins like polymerases, so they actually use the host DNA polymerase. These DNA polymerases, because they are DNA dependent DNA polymerases, we shorten that to DDDP, <laughs> DNA dependent DNA polymerase. Cellular DNA dependent DNA polymerase is not made at all times during the cell cycle. It's only made when our cells need to replicate their own genome. To get around this, our very small viruses will encode early enzymes that modulate the host cell cycle and drive the cell into S phase or synthesis phase. By forcing the cell into S phase, the virus is ensuring the production of the DNA dependent DNA polymerase and driving cell DNA replication, which means the virus is going to have access to plenty of DNTPs as well as the polymerase and can make more of its own genome just using host cell materials. By contrast, our large DNA viruses that have enormous viral genomes, enormous for viruses anyway, will encode most of their needed proteins and they can actually encode their own DNA dependent DNA polymerases and not have to use the host polymerase. I mentioned on the last slide that smallpox is able to encode most of its own machinery. Herpes virus, which is shown here, encodes its own polymerases. So does adenovirus, which we've mentioned in some of our other videos as well. So they encode their own polymerases, even though they still replicate in the nucleus of the infected cell. Now, as you are all aware, DNA replication requires a lot of different proteins working together to carry out this very complex process. So the proteins that are needed for DNA replication include the DNA-dependent DNA polymerase, as well as many other cellular proteins. And this is true for cellular DNA replication and viral DNA replication. So in addition to the DNA-dependent DNA polymerase, genome replication also requires origin-binding proteins, helicases to unwind DNA, single-stranded DNA binding proteins that keep the separated DNA from reannealing, DNA gyrases and topoisomerases, and we've talked about what roles those play in cells before. And of course, our cells need the enzymes to make DNTPs so that we can synthesize nucleic acid. Now, all of these things that our cells need, viruses need them too. Some viruses supply a part of these on their own, so they may have their own helicases, their own single-stranded DNA binding proteins, their own DDDP, but many simply use the host's equipment. Just because a virus has a DNA genome doesn't mean it looks exactly like our DNA genome. And in fact, even within our double-stranded DNA viruses, there is a great deal of diversity in the shape and the arrangement of those viral genomes. In A, we have a single-stranded DNA genome. This is adeno-associated virus, which is a parvovirus, one of those very, very small ones. In B, we have SV40, which is one of our most understood viruses of all times. And you can see it's actually a circular genome, whereas human adenovirus has a linear genome. Both of these are double-stranded. The herpes viruses down here, this is showing herpes simplex virus type 1, but they all have very similar structures. This is a linear double-stranded DNA, but it actually circularizes for DNA replication. And the pox viruses, which are incredibly strange, they are linear and they are double-stranded DNA, but their ends have these covalently linked terminal loops on each side. Because of these differences in genome structure, our DNA viruses have a number of different strategies to replicate their genomes. And we're not going to go over those in great detail, but let's remember that because they are DNA, replication proceeds much like our own DNA replication the same orientation of three prime and five prime ends, the same need for some sort of primer, and the final product is going to be a viral genome with the same structures that the original genome had. Like with DNA replication, viruses have a number of strategies by which they can carry out transcription. And for our DNA viruses, that's going to depend primarily on where those transcriptional components come from, the host or the virus. The simplest strategy is to use only host components to carry out transcription. The best examples here are very, very simple retroviruses as they have the smallest genomes. And if your genome is very, very small, you're not going to waste any of that important space. 
making proteins that you can get from another source. The second strategy is to use mostly host proteins plus one viral protein that is going to regulate transcription and act as a transcription factor. Prime examples of this strategy are complex retroviruses like HIV, papillomaviruses like HPV, human papillomavirus, and those very small parvoviruses that we've spoken about before. And again, these viruses still have very, very small genomes. Slightly more complex, mostly host proteins plus more than one viral protein that stimulates transcription. So this could be two, three, four proteins, however many are needed. And this is going to happen in some of our larger viruses like adenovirus and the herpes viruses. And these have pretty large genomes in the scheme of viral genome sizes. And then the final strategy, which is the most rare, is to use only viral components. This really only belongs to the pox viruses, like smallpox, because they have extremely large genomes. Now for most of the viruses that use host polymerases and a variety of other host components to carry out transcription, it's very, very important that those host proteins recognize viral promoters. If the viral promoters could not be recognized by host polymerase and host transcription factors, transcription of viral genes would never occur. Putting it all together, up top we have a viral DNA genome, which is used as the template for transcription of our pre-mRNAs. These get a 5' methyl guanine cap. They are then processed for the addition of a poly A tail, and introns are spliced out to give rise to our mature messenger RNA. And for the vast majority of our DNA viruses, all except for the pox viruses, this occurs in the nucleus of our cell. So all of these processes from transcription to splicing are the same as the cell and can involve cellular and viral machinery. The mature messenger RNA gets exported out of the nucleus just like cellular messenger RNAs do. And now these mature messenger RNAs can be translated using host ribosomes. And because these messages have a five prime cap, they have any splicing factors that would be found there at the joint of the exons, and they have a poly A tail, they look just like host messages, and the host cannot distinguish between viral and self messenger RNAs. Let's recap really quickly. Viral DNA replication will occur for our double-stranded viruses much like our own DNA replication. There are, of course, exceptions, and some viruses do things a little bit differently than how our cells do. Viral DNA replication can occur using host-only machinery, or it can be a combination of some host machinery plus some viral machinery. The transcription of viral messenger RNAs from a DNA genome is much like ours. Similar to DNA replication, viruses can use only host machinery to carry out transcription. They can use a combination of, of some host machinery plus one or more viral proteins that may act as transcription factors, or they can use entirely their own machinery to carry out transcription. From our DNA viruses, this results in the formation of mature messenger RNAs that have a 5' methylguanine cap, a 3' poly A tail, and the majority of DNA viral messages do get spliced, just like our messenger RNAs. And finally, translation. Again, we're not going over this much because it is entirely host machinery. No viruses encode their own ribosomes, and this occurs just like host translation, which you all have learned about before.